Welcome, everybody. I am so happy to have been asked to moderate this panel tonight because I'm a longtime fan of this book, uh, which you can tell by the sort of dog-eared quality of my copy. Um, it is an amazing, amazing craft book in, that, in which a lot of things that I had thought of just intuitively about writing were actually spelled out for me in, in, in very lucid, clear prose. Um, it's incredibly useful, so I'm very excited to talk about your book and then also to talk about publishing in general. I feel like panels are usually a bunch of authors preening over their books, and there's an editor who has to moderate it, and we're, we're flipping the ratio tonight. Um, so now we, uh, an author will moderate uh, a nice editor panel. Uh, but to start it off, I wanted to ask you guys a question. Um, at the end, we'll have time for questions from the audience, so I would love to hear what you guys have as questions. Um, some of these will come from the, uh, the book itself as a launching point, but some will just be more about writing in general. Um, but the sort of getting to know you, like if, if you're, the combined editorial work that you've done, or as, a, as an agent, like editing manuscripts from authors that you're agenting, uh, if you were put, putting that all together, what are the trademark values that you turn to again and again when you're looking at manuscripts? So like, what would be, what's like the Cheryl Klein motif, or what's your marginalia? Like, what are the things you always find yourself like, oh yeah, I do, that keeps coming up for me. This is something I look for in books. I'm curious from all four of you guys. Well, a few years ago, I did a blog post where I sort of went through all of my books and made like basically Venn diagrams of them. And it was fairy tales and diverse books and uptight young women who need to learn to relax. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, this is not autobiographical at all. Um, but uh, I think that is sort of the values of a, a lot of what I'm looking for is that because I'm a book lover from way back, I'm fascinated by stories and I'm fascinated um, also, so and fairy tales, you know, are sort of the way we meta think about stories for in children's books. Um, and then uh, I'm, diversity is I, whenever I think about diversity, I always think about fairness um, because you know, as a kid, I had that very strong sense of fairness that things should be fair, and that's the way I still feel feel now when I when we talk about publishing diverse books is that we need to have be more fair to everybody and publish more everybody's stories, and. Um, and then uptight young women who need to learn to relax. Uh, <laughs> I, I would widen that out to say that uh, it's really about how people grow up. You know, how you come to know that you're not the only person in the world and that there are lots of, uh, that the vision is wider than you and there are many, and, and, you, and how you gain perspective on the world. I think that's one of my stories I'm most fascinated by. So uh, that, those are sort of three of the motifs of what I do. That is a challenging question. Elliot refused to give us the questions beforehand. Yeah, this so. is all <laughs> <laughs> That said, they would be very easy. <laughs> um, I think for me, uh, I'll just stick with number three because that's a magic number in children's books. Um, one are books similar to what I loved reading as a child. Um, the other are books that reflect my interests now and what I like to read now and my life now. And then the third are books that I wished existed when I was a kid, but did not. So that kind of goes back to Cheryl talking about diverse books, because I was really hungering to see myself in the books I was reading, and I was not. So that definitely has informed a big chunk of the books that I've acquired and edited. It's on. Okay. So I'm really lucky getting the chance to write and edit because I get to showcase two very different sides of my personality. So for the books I write, I uh, wrote a series called The Hundred that is angsty, super smart, really tough teens who come down from space to recolonize Earth after nuclear war. And that is all about adventure and treachery and kissing, which are all great things. And then as an editor, I really edit mostly very sweet, magical middle grade about kids discovering their relationships with their friends and their families and maybe finding some lost magic along the way. And I sort of I love that I get to do both. So as an editor, I'm always looking for something with a really strong sense of place, uh, but with a little bit of a twist. So, you know, a town in a mountain, you know, in the mountains of Tennessee, but where magic used to be real. Or a town that's just like somewhere where you might have grown up, and, but except that superstitions are real. So if you step on a crack, you break your mother's back. So I love anything that's sort of recognizable, but with a little twist of the magical or the uncanny. And also, I guess, a lot of dark YA with 
girls who have the power to murder people, which I guess showcases a side of my personality I haven't quite come to terms with yet, but I'll be working through that on Twitter later and you can witness my personal growth. And they're also uptight and need to relax at the same time. It's, it's they a are. <laughs> and I agree with everything that's been said. Um, I think I was surprised to find what I was drawn to as an agent. Uh, I was expecting to work almost exclusively in fantasy, uh, since that's what I read almost exclusively from the age of eight until about 25. Um, but sort of in what seems to be a common theme here, I find myself drawn to uh, projects that these days would be called diverse projects. But for me, really, uh, I'm attracted to characters and environments that are different from my own experience. And being a white, straight male, um, I find myself uh, drawn to a lot of stories dealing with queer themes or uh, people of color or cultures or environments that are very different from either New York or where I grew up in the Northeast or different from an American culture in general. Um, for me, I, I just really like uh, the, dis the discovery process, uh, whether that's the unfolding mystery of a character's identity or the place that they're inhabiting or discovering along with the reader. Um, one thing I, I really enjoyed in the magic words was getting a little insight into how Cheryl diagnoses a manuscript. Uh, so like when you get something that you know needs needs to be fixed or helped, like how you go about it. And, and I mean, you can talk more about it, but it involves a checklist and there's a, a plot diagram. And, uh, but I'm curious about how each of you diagnose a manuscript. So this is something not, are you not sure if you want it or not, but like, how do I make this better? What are your, what are your steps? How do you go about making that happen? I'll start. And I probably have the most complicated process as well, um, which I outlined in the book. Um, when I read a manuscript I, and that I know I'm going to publish, um, I read it and I, I outline it as I go. And then I put notes in my outline as I go. And that allows me, by the time I get to the end of the book, you know, I'll often be doing this over a period of days, if not weeks. And that allows me to hold the whole book in my head as I go. And then once I get the outline done, I print it out, I highlight all the different plot strands, and then I write all over it, making notes and drawing connections, and oh, what if we move this here? Um, and then I have a plot checklist, which is in the book, which I go through to make sure that um, that the what what is the central plot? What is the emotional plot? How is this character growing and changing? What are the stakes of the book? Do, where are those established? What if they're not established? Where should we put them in? Um, how is the where's the inciting incident? I, I just use the checklist to make sure I have hit all of these things, um, and then based on that, I will uh, usually put together like a uh, to do list, basically like a list of thoughts of things that we need to go through to. Uh, to fix the book. And at that point, I might write to the author and say, um, sometimes I assign my author's homework beforehand, and I'll say, I make them outline the book sometimes. Um, or I make them write me a letter where they tell me all the things that, uh, that they think need work in the book. Because if they tell me that, that they already know that we need to fix the central character's journey, then that saves me having to tell them and we're on a better basis for a conversation. Um, and so from my notes and from the author's reflection letter and from whatever else other stuff we've put together, um, from that I put together an editorial letter, I send that off, and then at that point we usually have a conversation. Sometimes I end up writing a second editorial letter <laughs> based on the evolving vision of the book. And it's it's all pretty involved, but um, but it's also really really satisfying to to have all that conversation with really smart authors, and see the book sort of grow into the next thing it's going to be. Totally do the same thing. <laughs> no, I do not do that. <laughs> That's easy. I just pass the mic. <laughs> um, no, I, when I when, when I read. Yes, it, Cheryl makes me feel like I'm not doing my job as an editor. Um, I, and I think I do too much sometimes, so. Um, so my process, which I have, I, I wrote a blog post of the, about this a long time ago called How I Edit. Um, so my philosophy as an editor is um, I'm just acting as the role of the reader, so I'm just trying to anticipate anything that I feel like a reader will ultimately notice or take out take them out of the story or just complain about this plot line or this undeveloped character. Um, so I do the initial fresh read. So sometimes that's when I am reading a submission on acquisition. 
And when I do that, I just try to remember, and sometimes I jot down the notes of the things that bother me about a, a manuscript. And also, often at the submission stage, the acquisition stage, I am having to write a memo to our acquisitions committee about the book, and I will often include my editorial notes. So that's a good reminder for me to when I'm actually after I've acquired the book and I'm sitting down to edit the book, I'll look back at those notes and I'll incorporate that into an editorial letter. Um, but I always get the fresh read uh, impression, take down notes of things I notice. I try to uh, have a sitting time, like at least a day, ideally weeks, where just things percolate. So um, sometimes I've had the case where I've acquired a book and the, at the first read I think, this is this is perfect. I don't know what I would change. But inevit inevitably, in that sitting time, things come to this bubble to the surface. And I'm like, you know, the, the opening isn't quite as strong as it could be. Or, I, you know, I'll, I'll, all of these things will come to the surface during that sitting time. Kind of like when you're taking a shower and, you know, inspiration strikes. Um, so then I go through the manuscript again. And now I just do it all on computer. Um, I used to, used to be on paper, but now I just do it on track changes in wor Word. And I, you know, I don't. Why? It depends on the state of the manuscript, of course, but I'll just go, th go through, mark changes, um, take other notes in like a Word document separately, and those, those random notes in the Word document usually have to do with character, plot, structure, dial, like all of those elements. Um, and then after I'm done going through it, I'll look through all my notes again, add some things that I think need clarification in an editorial letter, and then I craft the editorial letter. And I structure it by, again, plot or character or that kind of thing, and I send it off to the author and rinse and repeat as many times as, as needed. Um, my process is very similar to Alvina's, but now I feel like I want to be more like Cheryl. I love the idea of a reflection letter. And that's just so cool. Yes. I think you it called it. Time a, if it takes you a while to get back to them. <laughs> you called it a letter to a sympathetic friend. I think in the book yeah. that you like. So imagine that the it's not like a, an enemy or a critic, but imagine someone that really loves you and just wants to understand how you feel about your book. Because that's who we are yeah. as editors. Uh, I think since Cheryl and Alvina answered that question so thoroughly and so well, I might adapt the question and talk about what it was like going from being an editor to being an author yeah, edited. Sure. So. I have two analogies that I use depending on the audience. I'm going to give you guys both. You can tell me which ones you like better. So when people ask what it's like going from being an author, an editor to an author. So I, one was like, um, it was like leading people through basic training for an entire career, but never having to do the obstacle course myself. So I'm standing there on the sidelines with my bullhorn, you know, you can make it over that hit, you know, faster, lower, da, 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 and giving them instructions. And sure that when it was my time to do it, I would have the muscle memory because I've been telling people how to do it for so long. Um, but I did not. <laughs> I, I just did not. It turns out it's a different muscle. So I owe so many people apologies. And the other analogy I use is that, um, if editing is like helping someone build a house and making sure that the foundation is laid correctly and all the rooms make sense and there's a logic to it and then later in the process that it's decorated correctly and there's the feng shui is right and sort of it's homey and inviting but also exciting, um, writing a book is like planting a tree and it's just a completely different part of the process. Um, and it turns out my experience editing didn't really help at all. <laughs> And I also thought it would help with the psychological aspect of it when I send my authors editorial letters. I say, OK, read it, then put it away. Then tell everyone in your life that I'm an idiot <laughs> and that I don't understand anything. And then read it again and then say that I'm still an idiot, but there's like one accidental point I made that makes sense. And then wait another day. And then eventually, after a week, you'll sort of get the sense of what works for you and what feels in line with your vision and what doesn't. And even though I knew that, I still had a lot of trouble. I was so defensive, and I went through the exact same process. And I guess it's just sort of a human thing, and you can't program that out of you. So I would like to say that being an editor helped. It didn't at all. And I'm going to try to be better in the future. Um, well, I definitely am still learning from each editor I work with. I keep on stealing some of their methods. Um, but uh, being an agent today, not every agent is editorially hands-on, but 
pretty much all the ones that I respect and the ones that I learned from uh, are very editorially hands-on, and that's why I ended up pursuing agenting rather than trying to become an editor like 90% of people that get into publishing. Um, I really liked the mix of creative and business that the world of uh, a literary agent seems to be today. Um, so this is going to sound cliche, but I do think it's pretty effective for most of the writers I'm trying to convince uh, to sign with me at that early stage. And I tell them that the way I try to approach editing their work uh, at that early stage before we send it to a publisher is I'm working with them uh, to find the strongest version of their vision. Uh, and I tell it to them that way so as to reassure them that I'm not going to give them notes and change their story from what it was at its heart. Uh, the idea is that hopefully I understand the story and the characters and the emotional and active uh, narrative arcs that are there. And uh, if we're gonna, if I'm going to steal uh, the tree metaphor, I'm I'm trimming the tree. Um, it's so a good looking tree at this point, you guys are like <laughs> you're doing a good job. <laughs> But um, oh, I had a, I had an awesome thing I was going to say, and it's completely oh, gone. <laughs> and I, it, it was brilliant. Trust me, it's his it fault. Was the meaning of, it was the meaning of life. Was about to. Yeah. Oh, I think it's just simply, uh, and this is another thing that I stole from editors, reassuring authors as well that uh, ultimately the notes and suggestions I'm I'm giving them are more of a creative springboard. I'm identifying problems or asking questions uh, for areas that might need further clarification, and I might offer an idea that I have for how to go about addressing it, but ultimately I'm, I'm much happier if they come up with a completely different solution on their own because uh, that application is going to feel just a lot more organic to the story than anything, any idea of mine they might insert in there. I think um, there's a lot of writers in the room, and many that I know are writers and many that I'm probably are writers and I'm not even aware yet, uh, but I feel like as a writer we sort of we learn a lot as we're as we're working, and you sort of incorporate thousands and thousands of pieces of advice or bits of knowledge that help you become a better writer. Um, but are there is there anything that you would point out? Like, what makes good writing? Like, is there is there some something that you a writer might not have considered, like a, a concern or a quality that that you want to bring up as far as what makes writing good? I know Cheryl, you mentioned one in, in the book. You mentioned um, good writing is not about you, uh, which I thought was an interesting way of phrasing it. Which <laughs> yeah, it's to, it's to, to a writer, I know, I know I said that. I'm trying to remember the context of it. The, um, getting out of the way, basically. Yeah, but. getting out of the way. I mean, I think quite often um, what I look for when I think about good writing is I look for like how is this writer creating an emotion that both for, like for the characters within the scene and then within me as a reader. Like I, I talk a lot about Rainbow Rowell in the book, in part because I think she just is is just like a master at making you feel with her characters and falling in love with her characters. Um, and I also think about, uh, <laughs> I was thinking about a term, uh, I, was, I was reading a manuscript recently, I thought, oh, this author is doing a lot of author splaining. You know, like like mansplaining, like the off, like the person keeps getting in there and telling you things you, you already know and, and over telling you stuff. And I thought, that's a bad quality, author splaining. Like you should just let let the stuff go, lay it out there, and 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 usually like people's feelings and emotions will arise sort of organically from what is happening, if you can get out of the way of beating somebody over the head about <laughs> everything that's happening, but the, everything that they should know that is happening. So, good writing, no author splaining, and brings up emotion. Um, I think for me. It's that good writing is subjective. I do feel like books I've loved, and I mean, you know, we see it at uh, submissions all the time. Like an agent obviously has fallen in love with the book, submits a book to editors. Most of the editors pass on it because they, for whatever re reason, don't love it. It could be that they don't think it's the writing is good, but then one editor decides that the writing is good. So um, I don't, I don't know exactly how to say how to identify good writing because I think writing that I think is good, other people think is terrible, and vice versa. Alvina and I actually demonstrated this recently. We, we judged as a thing that Slate did, um, where they had all of their editors write a picture book in one hour. 
And then the, predict the picture books were all not very good. But, uh, but then they, they, they sent awesome. <laughs> <laughs> they were all well written. Yeah, yeah, there we are. But they, they sent them all to me and Alvina and to Kat Przowski and then asked us to comment on them. And then we each had to pick a favorite out of these six. And all three of us picked a different favorite. Like we all had a different, different thought different ones were good. So for whatever reason. Yeah, that's sort of like Alvina. I actually don't spend a lot of time thinking about how to explain good writing because my job is just to know it when I see it or feel it. And there's sort of hallmarks for me now. It's that when I start reading lines aloud to people in the office because the writing has sort of unlocked emotions in me that I just can't keep to myself anymore. I think, was it Kafka who said that literature hacks the ice within? What, what is that quote? I'm sure. Yes, and living in New York and working publishing froses, freezes the sea in you sometimes. But that a great manuscript, a great submission, will thaw it out and make you remember what it's like to be a human <laughs> and who loves stories. And that's when I know. And then when I start, when I call my mom to read her lines, that's when I know this is something I need to snatch up quickly. Mm. Um, I acquired a book from Cheryl's agent, Bree, who's in the front row, and I called my mom at like 11 at night. I was like, you have to hear this line. So thank you for that, Bree. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's one of those annoying alchemy things of you know it when you see it. Uh, but since I go to a lot of conferences now, and uh, one of the go-to workshops that I teach is on, on how to write a compelling opening, um, in trying to distill that, uh, I came up with sort of a, a no-brainer approach when you really think about it. But I argued that there were kind of three elements uh, that when they're working kind of in synchronicity together, that's what helps uh, the opening of a story and, and ultimately probably the rest of the narrative flow really well. And you don't start, you don't stop, you don't question it. And that's when the uh, world building, the character development, and the plot de development are all working kind of in tandem. So when you are writing to kind of tell the reader a little bit more about the world, at the same time, that's informing some understanding or new knowledge about the character and driving the plot forward as well, rather than having one after the other. And that's when it starts to feel kind of choppy or it jars you out of the action because uh, the first paragraph is all about kind of trying to show you what this fantasy world is, and then you have to meet the main character. So a couple of sentences devoted to that. And, oh, yeah, now you need to, the story to get going, so you develop a couple elements to plot before then you need to tell a little bit more about the world. Um, so it's a really easy direction to give of all the three should work together. But going over, you know, some of those uh, killer openings and just those, uh, those lines where you, you just read it aloud to somebody and they know that it's magical. I, I think for me, it's those three elements all working together when it happens. I agree. I think that's so well said. I didn't realize I thought that, but I guess I do. When I do writing exercises, I tell people that sort of my pet peeve as an editor is getting beautiful descriptions of the setting that don't tell me anything about the character's state of mind or their emotions. So I have people write descriptions of a sunset from the point of view of someone who's in love or someone who is in pain or someone who just hates nature. But I, I like the way you said that. Sorry, I'm going to steal the sunset exercise yes, too. So. See, this is, this is so revolutionary. Cheryl, thank you. Um, is, is there anything that, that you guys wish these the manuscripts were being written or submitted that aren't out there? Like, is there something that if you could just inject 10 more books about this or that tell a story this way? Or is there anything that you're hungry for that you just don't find? I think I'm hungry for more diverse books of every single kind, like particularly in genre, like diverse romances, diverse science fiction, diverse fantasy. Like we definitely have an amazing um, plethora of books coming out now about it from uh, from authors of color. But I think that there's so much more to explore that hasn't been done. Um, well, a couple of years ago, I went to, uh, to went to India on my honeymoon, and um, and just you know, walking around like the Agra Fort, which is this place, this fort that is um, like three miles in circumference. And just thinking about all the stories that had taken place there that we never hear, you know, in the West, like even just the historical stories that we never hear. And it just sort of drove home for me, like how big the world is and how small a fraction of it we have. So I love it when people can find some story like that in the world and bring it to an American audience 
through the tale of one particular kid or adult or, or young adult growing up. So I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I want a book about co-joined twins. <laughs> so agents, if you have one, please send it to me. Like all the iPhones come out. <laughs> uh, I absolutely agree with Cheryl. Uh, I want to take my childhood love of fantasy and apply that more to the uh, the emphasis on diversity that we're seeing in children's books, but does need to be pushed further. And yeah, there, there's so much amazing mythology and folklore out there already. I mean, you don't even have to make it up. You just need to to either go to or come from another part of the world and start telling stories and inspired by that particular pocket. Um, I'll, ask, I'll ask one more question, then we'll open it up to the audience. Uh, but I'm always curious about, I feel like there are words that I turn to that are just weird Elliot Schrafer words. Like I like quail as a verb. Um, and it's it always like any most people who read it just kind of like are startled by it and it doesn't really work. So it always gets edited out. Um, <laughs> but are there, are there words like that you would say like an author should just use once a book or never um like favorite words or just words you want to um to ban from the pages i mean i'll say one thing if you work on multiple books with an author you really get to know their brain and you get to know like the things that they do over and over again like i have one author who um writes a lot about sort of tough guys and he'll often talk about a, a guy walking around with his arms sort of puffed out like he wants to prove that he's tough and the images recurred in every single one of his books so it's almost like i look at it look for it when i get a new manuscript i'm like oh this must just be a preoccupation of his brain is he putting it in at this point no i don't think he is happens? i think it's just like there's another author of mine who who often has a character drink coffee or one of our characters will drink coffee with their eyes closed you know you, you just <laughs> you just get to know this these patterns um and and i sometimes i call it out and most times i'm just like oh that's so you know <laughs> this is sweet um but i would say like there's nothing that there's nothing that i edit out consistently besides the words or or i take as a red flag besides youngster or youth like if I see a, if I see somebody the author referred to like and then the youngster went skipping across the plane or something I'm just like oh no you don't know what you're doing you should not be writing for children you need to read more because it's looking at it from the for youngsters because <laughs> it's looking at the at the kids from the outside and from a very older outside perspective rather than a contemporary sympathetic viewpoint. Any other words? Um, well, the the word that I overuse in my like editorial, well, not editorial letters, because you can't overuse this word, but if I'm writing an editor letter in an arc or something, I do overuse the word love, which I think is a good thing. Oh. Um, <laughs> but the two words that are popping in my mind that I do notice like stand out to me in manuscripts, and I'll say only use this once, is liminal and uvulate. You, you, I can't even say that word. Yes. I don't know. I just like, why? No. <laughs> Liminal feels like such a un, like undergraduate word. Like it was in every essay that I you know, wrote. I overuse a ton of ghost imagery metaphor. You know, the ghost of a smile, the ghost of an echo. But that's mostly in books set on Earth. And then in space, I do the space version of that, which is everything is like light emitted from a dying star. Like I just, <laughs> I love that. You know, like the star could be dead, but the light's still there because it's light years away, and it's sort of like metaphor for love and grief and whatever you want it to. And things are also always imploding under the weight of their own whatever, like a dying star. <laughs> so if anyone wants to search, you know, the hundred books and see how many times that, you know what, don't do that. That's a waste of your time. <laughs> Anything you want to ban, Brooks? Uh, I have so many pet peeves. I'm not going to bore you all with them because it's just going to reveal my inner curmudgeon. I'm very grumpy. Uh, <sighs> Look, I challenge you guys, especially when it comes to middle grade, not everyone winks when they're mischievous, and I'm so sick of seeing it. And, and that's not to say characters can't wink, it's just that that seems to be like, basically go-to expressions to show some sort of character trait, whether it's a wink, or it's a twisted grin, or... Th they all have their place, but not, you know, 30 times in two chapters. Uh, I'm going to stop there before this gets ugly. And people start to weep Someone, and get out their manuscripts. Yeah.